Welcome everybody to um, the latest ANS Nectar and RDS webinar. My name is Susanna Sabine from the Australian National Data Service and I'm your host for today. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Martin, Martin Schweitzer, who if you've seen any of the visualisation webinars has um, helped us a few times. Uh, Martin is a data technologist with ANS in the Melbourne office. Um, he has a background in computer science and a particular interest in visualisation, data science and user interface design. His background includes working on large IT systems, lecturing, as well as running training courses and workshops. And Martin is currently seconded to us from the Bureau of Meteorology, where he's responsible for managing the climate record of Australia. But today, he's talking about something which I knew nothing about <laughs> and hope to learn a lot more. Um, he's talking about APIs without the jargon. So, Martin. Thanks very much, Susanna. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Today, among other things, we're going to be trying some of the things live. So uh, we also have to have some uh, fingers crossed when we do that. So web APIs, what are they? Why are they useful? Why should we be interested in them? So I was asked a question several months ago now about one of the scientists at work came to me and said, can you explain to me, I've been hearing all this stuff about web APIs. What exactly is a web API? And I knew that she was very bright. Um, not, not I, I didn't have to dumb anything down, but she basically she wasn't that interested in the IT part. Uh, she really wanted to know what's useful. So I had to think about how to describe what a web API is to somebody who may be not technical on the programming side. And the definition I came up with was this. It is a web page that has been optimized to be read by a computer rather than by a human. And I think that really encompasses what web APIs are all about. And I've used this definition for quite a while. Maybe it's not 100% perfect, but it's 99% perfect. And so if you want to know what a web API is, um, that's it. So the rest of the talk will really be elaborating on this idea and giving some examples and giving examples of how we use them, why we use them, and so on. So I'll start it with a little use case. So every morning I like to wake up half an hour before the sun rises. And of course the sun rises at different times every day. So if I want to know what time the sun rises, one of the ways I can find out is I can visit this web page. So I'll just open this web page. And here we go. This is the Norwegian Weather Service. It shows me the weather for Melbourne. But down here, we see sunrise is 7.18. So this morning, the sun rose at 7.18. So that's great for me. But being a software developer, the next thing I want to do is write a little program that's going to, let's say, send me a tweet or an SMS half an hour before the sun rises. In other words, uh, wake me up or give me a heads up that the sun is about to rise in half an hour. So if I want to do that, <clears throat> one way is to say, OK, go to this website, look for what time the sun rises. And so we can actually view the source code or the source of this page. And if we do, it's, there's a whole lot of stuff there. Um, I'll just go back to the slides because it's a little bit clearer there. So what we see is somewhere on that page, there's the following text. I, I prepared the slide a while back, so that's when the sun was still rising at 6.44, not 7.18. But we see this text. So once we know that that web page contains that text, the next thing we can do is write a little program that, look, that grabs that page off the internet, looks for the text, and figures out the time. So here's the program. I wrote it in Python. And what we're going to do now is we're going to try and run this little program. So I'll just copy it. And I'm using something called Jupyter Notebook, which allows us to run programs in a web page. So here's my web page. Here's my program. And I press shift enter and that should run the program. And if all goes well, we should see 718. I won't explain exactly how the program works because uh, it's not important for this. What is important though is that 
often it's really easy if we've got a web page to write a program that pulls something off that web page. However, as we saw before, we're actually looking for this text inside the web page. And that text has nothing to do with Sunrise. It's simply how they've decided to style the web page. So if they decide today, it would be nice to put the word Sunrise in bold, my program will start, suddenly stop working. Um, if they decide instead of the word Sunrise, to make it two words, my program will suddenly stop working because it's looking for this exact text. And this is where we get onto web APIs. So let's just start, we, we're not going to use this, we want to use the web API. I did a quick Google and I found, oh, sorry, uh, does it work? Yes. Okay, so now I find a web API on the internet. It looks very similar. We've got a URL. The only difference or the major difference is in this case, um, we're giving it a latitude and longitude, which happens to be the Latin long of Melbourne. So I'll open this URL, in, sorry, a new page. Let's go to it, open link in new tab. And there we go. So what we see here is similar results. Uh, we've got something called results. Um, and we can see that all we've done is opened a web page. But in this case, the web page doesn't look nice with colors and formatting, etc. It's just text. In other words, it's been optimized for a machine. I'll just show you what it looks like if we format it a bit. So this is the same results, just formatted slightly. And what we see is we've got these curly brackets and inside what we have are keys and values. So one of the keys is results and inside that we've got keys and values. So one of the keys inside that is sunrise and there we've got a time, 8.44 p.m. So that's the first surprise. Why is it 8.44 p.m.? Well, the reason it's 8.44 p.m., we know sun doesn't rise at 8.44 p.m., is because, we'll just go back to this page, we see what happened is we gave it a latitude and longitude. So it knows nothing about time zones. So what it does is it returns the time in UTC, Universal Co Coordinated Time. And in this case, it was 9.19 p.m. If we add 10 hours to get Melbourne's time, we get 7.19 a.m., which is the correct result. Just remember, we've got this key results, and inside the key results, we've got sunrise, and that tells us the time. So now we write a Python program to find the sunrise using our API. Um, here's our API, uh, here's our program. Um, this is the URL we saw before that we're looking at, uh, Melbourne's latitude, minus 37.734, et cetera. And this last line is the important one. So I've got this thing that has returned, which we'll call J. And you remember there was something inside there called results, and inside results there was something called sunrise. So let's now run this program. I'll just copy it here, and we'll go back to our Jupyter notebook, and we'll paste it in there, and we'll run it. And once again, the there's probably a small rounding error there because um, this one gives us 719, whereas that one gave us 718. But it's close enough that uh, we're comfortable. There's also a couple of ways in which sunrise is defined. So we now see how we can use an API and what use it is. And of course, now that we've got this API, we can substitute in any lat long. So we could go back to where we've got this API and um, we can go a few degrees south, let's say minus 40 south. So for um, Melbourne, it was 
and we'll just go to this call, this web page. And um, sunrise is now 9.26. So as we go south in winter, the sunrise is later. Okay, so at this stage, and I've um, spoken about web APIs before, I often get the question, so is the web API the program that is behind this? Is it the software? Or is it the protocol? Is it that format that we saw the data in is a format that's known as JSON? So does the web API mean that it comes in JSON? Or is it the data that we're getting back or the format? Um, which part of this is the web API? And it's a tricky question, but what I say is it's sort of none of those specifically, and in a sense, it's all of that. So what the web API is, is it is a contract between a supplier and a consumer that a particular URL will return particular data, and maybe I could add in a particular format. In other words, it's that contract that defines the API. It's saying that if you go to this URL, we'll give you back the time of sunrise in this particular format in UTC. So that's what the web API is. And of course, in order to do that, you need the software, you need the protocol, you need the data and the format, et cetera. Okay, and here's just an example that the return data, I, in my first example, sorry, I gave it as JSON, but people may be familiar with other formats. One other very common format is one called XML. Exactly the same results, uh, the same sunset under that uh, tag results but in a different format. So the format doesn't have to be JSON. And further on, we'll see other examples where we're returning data that aren't exactly JSON. So if you've ever sat in a meeting room with a bunch of developers and people have said, oh, um, we need an API to deliver this data, to present this data, to write this website, almost inevitably somebody says, great, we'll do a RESTful API. And it's become very much a buzzword. What does it mean? Well, RESTful is an abbreviation of representational state transfer. And the idea and the concepts were come from a dissertation which was written by Guy Roy, Roy Fielding in 2000. And unfortunately, about 90% of people who talk about RESTful APIs are a, sometimes vaguely aware of this dissertation, but probably haven't read, read it, and have heard the hype and have heard the term RESTful, so they know that that's a good thing and everything should be RESTful, but don't really understand uh, what it's all about. So the title of the dissertation was called Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based Software Architectures, which doesn't sound like it's got much about APIs. I, I've got to admit, I'm actually one of the people who has not read the full dissertation, although I have read several parts of it a few times. So I know maybe enough to talk a little bit about it. But in, in this dissertation, Roy Fielding came up with a number of what he called architectural constraints. And basically, the first one is he talks about a client-server architecture. And so just to, if you, you may be familiar with the terms client-server architecture, but not familiar exactly what they mean. So when we talk client-server architecture, we're talking about a client, and all that a client is for this purpose is the machine that's on your desktop or your mobile phone, or wherever you've got your web browser running, it could be your iPad or whatever, that's the client. The server simply refers to somebody else's computer, uh, which it usually and often is a, a very big computer somewhere. And a client server architecture means that the client and the server, your browser 
and their machine, let's say Amazon.com, are linked together by some kind of network, and in this case, it's the internet. So basically, our computer is talking to their computer and their computer is talking to our computer. He also comes up with another, uh, a number of other constraints. We're not going to go into them in this talk uh, because they're all jargon and this is a talk without the jargon. But he talks about things like statelessness, cacheability, load system, code on demand, and a uniform interface. So knowing this and knowing simply talking about cloud server architectures, we can actually say something sensible about RESTful APIs. And this is the, what I believe is the most important part of a RESTful interface. And that is everything that is needed by the server to fulfill a request is contained in the URL. In other words, the thing that we type at the top into the browser bar should be enough to tell the server at the other end the information we need. In other words, um, we saw the example earlier, we want to know what time sunrise is, and inside that URL we gave the address of the server and we also gave the lat long of the place that we're interested in. So it, this isn't 100% accurate, so this is a slightly more accurate description of RESTful interfaces. Everything that is needed by the, by the server to fulfill a request is contained in the request. There are times when your browser will send a little bit more information to a server than you actually see in the URL. And, it, and that's fine for, uh, it can still be a RESTful interface, as long as each request um, sends exactly what it needs. But the most important part is that first part. The URL ideally should contain everything that is needed. Okay. so. So far, what we've seen is just getting a single, uh, let's call it a fact, uh, the time sunrises in Melbourne. However, a very common case, and the case that, uh, from the ANS perspective, that we're very interested in, is getting data by an API. In other words, I, I've written some APIs, I've written a lot for work, um, and typically, we provide data, we provide lots and lots of data, and our preferred method of providing data is via an API. So I've written a small toy API for the purpose of this talk, and so there's a lot of climate data for Australia. In particular, there's a climate network called ACORN, which is the Australian Climate Observation Reference Network. And what that is, is 112 weather stations around Australia that have a very long climate record. So here's an example which goes to my server. And what I'm saying is I want the temperature and rainfall data um, for the station number 9021, which happens to be Perth Airport. So if I go to this, AP, uh, this web site or this URL, I will just call it, and, okay, there. and what we see is it's returned a whole lot of data, and if we look at the first date, it goes back to 1910, and if we scrolled all the way down, we would find its values for every day um, up to 2010, so roughly 100 years of data. And if, so if we looked at it and formatted nicely, it would look like this. So there are different things we return, and one of them may be just simply that the query was successful, or if there was an error, some details why we got an error. And then there's the data. And for each data point, for each day, we've got a date. We've got the maximum temperature, so on uh, 1st of January 2010, the uh, maximum temperature at Perth Airport was 31.3. Uh, the minimum temperature was 13.2. And precip or precipitation, there was zero millimeters of rain. So somebody wanting that data, and remember there are 112 stations, may not want 100 years of daily data for 100 stations. So 
the next thing we can do with our API is add parameters to it. So we want to, for example, be able to add a start and end date. So we'll go back to this and it's been designed so I can say start date equals the 1st of January 2010. And I run it again and very quickly I get my new data back. And now we see that the first date is 2010 and it will go for the whole year. But maybe I just want to go for the one year, uh, for the one month. So I can put an end date. So my end date is 2010, 31st of the first. So I want one month of data and run it again. And now I've got one month of data. However, maybe I don't like working with JSON for whatever reason. I want my data CSV. So I've added another option, and this option allows me to specify what format I want my data in. And once again, we separate these parameters. The convention, well, uh, convention is, or the standard is with the ampersand, and I write format equals CSV. I get my data back, and this time I get a CSV file, station number date, uh, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and so what we're now seeing is that if I'm a researcher and I want some data and somebody has developed an API and they've done it nicely, I've got a really good, simple way to get that data. I can um, slice and dice that data, uh, ideally. I, I can, for example, I can say, okay, I, I want Perth Airport, but I also want Melbourne, which happens to be, uh, let's say, 86071. And there's Melbourne's temperature for January 2010 uh, and rainfall. I see we've got a bit of rainfall there. So we can add the start and end date. We can change the format. It's a really nice way to be able to get data. Now, I know all this. And the next question is, how do you know this? And unfortunately, I haven't, I just need to get a new tab here. Well, there's a tool called Swagger, which allows us to document our APIs. And so I've written some very simple documentation for my API. And the, so somebody wanting to use my API can go to this side of the page, the right-hand side, and they can say, I'm interested in temperature or I'm interested in rainfall, etc." So for temperature, they, uh, sorry, I've just got two screens here and so I don't see the right-hand side, there we go. They can click there, uh, temperature. And they see, okay, there's an API called Get Acorn Data. There's documentation, what it does, temperature and rainfall for a given site. I click there and it tells me what's required. So I require station number. Uh, there's the rest are optional, the start date, the end date and the format. And it says I can try it out. So I click there. And it says, okay, give me a station number. So I type in 86071. Um, for this one, we will put in, uh, let's put in a start date, 2010-101 and an end date, 2010-03, let's say, um, don't remember, 31. And I'll say execute. So in this documentation, we can actually execute a query. And it also shows us, for example, yeah, what URL we would need to use to get that data. There's another API I've got here because one thing you may say to me is, well, this is great, but I don't know what these station numbers are. Well, I've written an API to get information about the stations, and that's over here. And um, we've got one parameter, uh, which is the station name, try it out, okay. 
And so if this works, if I type in PER, I want to find all stations um, with PER, maybe Perth and um, Prosopin, et cetera. And we see we get this result, this response. We get Perth, station number 9021. Um, Esperance, because it's got PER in the name, um, we get the station number. We also get a lot of metadata about the station, uh, its elevation, its latitude, its longitude, uh, the date it was opened, etc. So if I wanted to find out information about uh, Laverton or whatever, I, would, I could go here, type Laverton, execute, find out what the station number is for Laverton, and then go and get the data. The left-hand side <clears throat> is how I've specified what you see on the right-hand side. And I've specified it using a format or a language called YAML, yet another markup language. And what this means is that because it's a formal language, that this specification is also machine readable. So the right-hand side is readable by humans, the left-hand side is readable by machines. So a machine can go off, find out how to use their API and actually make queries against it. So that's our documentation. Now, in the examples we've seen so far, we've just seen text from the API, but we can get more than text. And here's an example. So I guess the first thing is to have a look at this URL, which actually happens to be quite a long URL. And we'll just go to that URL and see what it uh, happens when we look at it. So there's the URL there. And this is returned an image. And if you look carefully at the image, it's the eastern side of Australia. So the next question may be, well, what's the point of a URL that returns an image? Well, here's an application, a little web app that I wrote a couple of years back. And what this does is, A, it presents a map of Australia, and if we look carefully, uh, we'll recognize um, that map from the previous one. But it, what it actually does is it allows us to click on a point on the map, and it gives us three words. Uh, so for that point, the three words are frequent, expense, find. If we click somewhere near Brisbane, uh, we get three different words, audience, replace, accept. So if I go somewhere and type in audience, replace, accept, it should take me back to that previous point where I was near Brisbane which it does. Okay, but the important part of this is we've got this map, we can zoom in. In fact, we can zoom in quite a lot. Um, I forget how much I allowed people to zoom in. I think you actually done to the street level. Okay. Now, I used a JavaScript or web tool called Leaflet to create this map on my web page. I also knew that there was something which supplied tiles, map tiles, what we're seeing here is map tiles, called Bright Earth E Atlas. But all I had to tell Leaflet is that this is the URL for Earth Atlas. I didn't have to tell it what, well, I told it, it, it it assumed that it's using this format called WMS, which is a standard API. And once it knew that it was using WMS, it knew how to call those tiles. And in fact, we can just, if we go and inspect here, yeah, what we can actually see is, just zoom in here. Yeah. And what we can see is all these calls. So for every, time we move the map or change it, it makes about 12 or 16 calls because those, each of those tiles were small and it stitches them together. So there's one example of a tile. <clears throat> there's another example, another example, another example. So basically each time we zoom in or out or uh, pan the map, 
it will go off and get up a whole lot more tiles uh, using this web API that's being provided by Bright Earth Atlas. Now, the important thing is how does Leaflet know the specification um, to read and how does Bright Earth know the specification to write? And their standards, and in these particular standards, uh, WMS for Web Mapping Service, are controlled by a group called OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium. So basically, if I want to write some software to display maps, all I have to do is follow that uh, standard, and I can use any WMS provider. And that, that's one of the great strengths of using APIs and writing them to a common uh, specification. Other people can use something that's been written to that specification without knowing anything more about us. Okay, so the final part of my talk is um, because of, in the end, we're interested in FAIR, which is making data findable accessible, interoperable, and reusable. How does this fit in with APIs? What is it about APIs that can make find data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? So hopefully now we've seen some of those things without even talking about it much further. Data that's available as an API, we can um, explore it, we can find out the metadata to find out about that data. It's Definitely accessible in terms of um, it's available in formats like JSON, which is an open standard. It's available in CSV, etc. Um, in We'll look at two particular aspects of FAIR. And one is the um, principle F3, which is findable principle number three. And that is that metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. And the second is principle A1 for accessible one. And that is that metadata are retrievable by the identifier using a standard communications protocol. Now, ANS has a few services, uh, APIs. So in other words, as well as being able to go to ANS and do manual searches, we can also do machine searches. And I'm going to give in the next couple of slides a couple of, of examples of that. So the first thing we're going to look at is we have this page, and that's the ANS collection, which is, so we'll make these slides available after the talk, and so all these links are in the slides. Um, and obviously you're welcome to try anything in the slides. One thing I would ask you though is in that API that I've provided, it was written very quickly. It was written simply to demonstrate an API. So it's definitely not industrial strength. Um, the data for all intents and purposes is just demonstration data. Um, so just be forgiving if it doesn't always do. If you give it a valid URL, it should, it should always work. But if you, uh, there's not a lot of error checking, etc. Anyway, getting back to the ANS API. So you'll see that there's a number of APIs that ANS does provide, and they're all documented on this page. And as I say, there's the link to this page in the slides over here. So the first thing we do is have a look at one of these APIs. And in particular, um, there's this one, which is the Get Metadata API. And what we're going to do is pass a query. And so we want to query the ANS metadata. And we're going to say, okay, we want to query the class is collections. We want to query the collections class. And we want to look for the search term Australian Ocean Data Network. And uh, there's probably a lot of it. So I'm simply interested in the first 30 rows. And of course, this is all documented on the ANS page. So let's just try going to that um, URL. And here we go. So what we see is status success. We, we can tell uh, from those um, brackets at the beginning and end that this is probably JSON, the format. Um, there's a message, a number five. 
And this one is the documents, and there's a number of documents. And we see that the first one has a slug called Coral Reef Health Jack Australia. It's got a key, AODN. It's got a display title, Coral Reef Health Database, uh, Reef Jack Australia, etc. And we, if we looked carefully, it's not very well formatted, but there are 30 and just uh, a little bit bigger, I realize. So it, it, it's uh, returned the first 30 records. Okay, so we'll go back to this first one and we noticed it had this key. So the next API we'll look at is saying, okay, uh, there's just a better formatted um, version of what we saw. Uh, the status was success. The message was it found 11,530 matching entries. We're starting at entry number zero, and this is the first document. And it's got this key, which ends in FF67. So the next thing we will do is to use this metadata. And this time, instead of giving it a class, we give it this particular key. And we say what we want to do is see all the fields for this key. So we'll go to this one and add the link. And uh, sorry. Ah, yes, and it, it's not easy to see this once again. However, what I'll do is go back to the slide, and uh, if we had formatted it, we would have seen the following. So using these APIs allows us either manually or by machine to get a whole lot of rich data. There's another part of FAIR is to use standard vocabularies and, and supports a number of vocabulary services. And in this particular one, we're going to look at one example, in this uh, example, we're going to look at the geology vocabulary, and we'll just quickly go to this page over there. So it did say, if we look at the URL, API slash LDA, etc. However, when we look at the results, it looks like a human readable form. Well, up top here, we also see there's JSON, RDF, text, etc. So either we can click on JSON and we see we get exactly the same data back, but this time in JSON. And what I'll do is what we see is all it's done is it's put JSON there. So if I take the word JSON out and I run that query again, I get the same result back in human readable or HTML. I could have also done .html. Um, I think we also had XML, so we'll just try XML. And this time we get the, exactly the same data back, but in a different format. And that's one of the things I alluded to earlier, that we can get the same data in different formats. So that's pretty close to what we're going to say about APIs. I thought just a nice note to end it would be to look at how APIs are regarded in the wider world. And people may have heard of Amazon. And the CEO, of, uh, sorry, um, I've missed one slide. Um, no, I haven't. It's, uh, my slides are the wrong way around. Uh, so the, the chief executive officer of Amazon is a guy, Jeff Bezos. And he wrote a memo to staff, and in the memo, he talks about service interfaces, but another word for service interfaces is APIs. And this is a memo that was accidentally leaked. And if you go to this URL, you'll find um, this post where the person writes about the memo. So what did Jeff Bezos, what was his view on APIs? Well. He said, number one, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through APIs, or in his word, service interfaces. 
teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. Three, there will be no other form of inter-process communication allowed. Four, it doesn't matter what technology they use. And I'll quickly say one of the very important things about APIs is that if I've got an API, let's say, for my um, climate data, and I'm using, uh, let's say, PostgreSQL, and, sick, and you're using my API to get your data, and each day you're running a query that queries my API, and next month I decide, okay, I'm going to actually change to Oracle. And I keep my API. You will have no idea that I've changed to Oracle because the API insulates you from any changes in the underlying technology. And that's one of the huge strengths of APIs, that they do insulate you from what that underlying technology is. Anyway, getting back to Jeff Bezos. Five, all APIs without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. And so basically saying that we must be able to use the same API internally and externally. And six, I think, gives an idea of um, Jeff Bezos and how much um, he regarded APIs. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. And finally, seven, thank you, have a nice day. And then if you read this post, the author of the post says, actually, I just added number seven as a joke. Jeff Bezos doesn't care if you have a nice day or not. So I, I was going to um, mention one other thing. So while you can access the ANS fun API, you may also be interested in, okay, what data that's provided by Audio is available um, from ANS. And this is currently an ongoing project, and ANS is busy um, collating and collecting all these data sets that are available via APIs. And so there's a page that's talking about the current, set, um, current state and future direction of um, enhancing data service discovery. So uh, watch the space. So that's it. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. Um, there is one question that came through earlier that's uh, asked. So in your first example, your script could easily have been broken by new formatting, etc., on the website, whereas the API is designed to be computer readable and the format will change, oh, sorry, will not change. Um, is that right? <laughs> so if you'd formatted the website, that's okay. it. Your little yeah, script won't work anymore, whereas the API, yeah. API is... At a high level, that's absolutely correct. Anybody who's worked in computers for more than a few months knows that everything changes. The thing with APIs is that what people do is they'll put a version number into the API. So they'll say, uh, like, slash API, slash V1, slash... And the whole idea of that V1 is that if we do make any changes, we'll publish a new API and it will be slash V2, slash. So in the ones we saw, they were very simple ones, but almost any API that's being used in a kind of production environment should always have a version number. And if it doesn't, beware, because um, it's a sign that the person who wrote it probably isn't aware that APIs always change. I, I guess another thing about APIs is that it is possible when they do change to still support the old format. So I can say, okay, um, I'm going to add a new um, data format, let's say YAML. So now you can say format equals CSV in my data API or format equals YAML but it doesn't break the old API. Okay. All right. Um, that's the only question that we've had come through at the moment, apart from a, oops, there's one came through. We had someone who said that they had to leave, but um, it was thank you for it and we're looking forward to um, testing the slides <laughs> to have a look at what you've done. Um, the question here is, are the, <clears throat> 
other words from Troy Mott's random or algorithmically selected from some data source. So from your little uh, API that you wrote there. Right. Um, so what I did is I googled the thousand most frequent words because initially I'd written it and you came up with so the idea was that I can say to somebody, okay, meet me at um, jelly tomato staple. And so it must it's no good if I have to say meet me at pneumococcal um, astrophysics something or other. So I found a list on the internet of the 1,000 most frequent words, and I used those words, so all those words, so that I'd have some. I also took out words like and, the, but, etc. Then I used an algorithm called a geo hash that gives you a number from a lat long, and I converted that to the three words. I thought, Martin, that you'd used the um, app What Three Words, which takes the whole world and divides it into um, three metre squares and um, assigns the three words to them. So that was uh, the that's what I thought you'd, you'd looked at. I, it, that was definitely the inspiration. So what happened is that um, three words went a bit viral at work. Mm -hmm. And I said to Look, you know, they, they said, "Wow, well, isn't this awesome?" I said, "It's a really easy thing to write. If you know, it shouldn't take more than a day or so." And they didn't believe me, so I had to prove that one could write something. <laughs> now, um, Three Words is a wonderful site, but it's closed source, and I thought oh. it would be wonderful if there was an open source, you know, version of that. And they did so, the same yeah. thing. Okay. Um, have we got any other questions from the people who are still on the line? If not, I'll have to say thank you very much to everyone who attended today. Um, and thank you very much to Martin for giving your time again to um, give this webinar. Um, and we have a couple of people here saying thank you and can't wait to see the slides. Um, I know there's a couple of people who want to go and often play with your APIs. <laughs> All right. Thank you, every, um, everyone.